Welcome to another episode of the Manufacturing Executive Podcast. I'm Joe Sullivan, your host and a co-founder of the industrial marketing agency, Gorilla 76. 1962. That was the year the first industrial robot went to work when GM deployed Unimate in their die casting factory. Fast forward almost 60 years and robots are everywhere in the manufacturing space, but they're far from a commodity. And today's guest will talk about why. He'll also dive into the role robots are playing in filling the manufacturing labor shortage, the changing role of cobots, and what's on the horizon in an ever-evolving world of robotics. So on that note, let me take a moment to introduce our guest. Ryan Lillibridge is the Director of Business Development at Mission Design and Automation. With over 15 years of experience in the automation industry, serving as an applications engineering manager and process owner, Ryan enjoys the opportunity to help establish a winning team and culture by focusing on the people and attributes of a strong team. Ryan lives near Grand Rapids, Michigan with his wife, Liz, and three boys. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Joe. I'm just uh, grateful for the opportunity to talk with you and your audience and uh, learn more from you. Yeah, me too. We got a, a great topic here and I'm excited to, to get into it. I think a lot of our listeners are going to be, um, this is kind of right up their alley. So uh, let's let's do this thing, huh? Yeah, for sure. Let's go. Cool. Um, okay. So you and I were talking recently, Ryan, about the fact that robots have been around for 60 years, which is kind of, kind of crazy to think about, you know, I, I wouldn't have guessed that, but, um, but you know, they're, they're more readily available now than ever. And in some ways, the traditional industrial robot is almost becoming commoditized, but at the same time, the advancements being made in the ro- in robotics right now are immense. And I was hoping you could kind of talk about where you see some of the biggest and most impactful changes happening in robotics. Sure. Yeah. I like to talk about that kind of stuff. So, you know, I think, uh, yeah, 60 years, that's a long time, right? So you think about that and what else has been around for 60 years and, and been unchanged, um, industrial robot arms are, have, have been evolving over that time, but they're always been working towards going faster, being more accurate and high volume production, right? Typically automotive. So a lot of those robots and the programming structures have not evolved to the point uh, that's needed now in a lot of the manufacturing areas. So they're continually trying to evolve those and you're seeing these edge companies and different devices come in to evolve those robots and and help them continue to bring value uh, outside of maybe some of the larger automotive companies that are pulling them in. Um, They'll still continue to bring value in those high volume areas and they're the perfect tool for that. Um, The tool is, uh, very valuable there, but I think what we're seeing is you need a system integrator to do that. And there's a lot of system integrators now. So it does become somewhat of a commodity as the tool has been around so long and people are using that and regularly programming that and implementing that. But a lot of the smaller manufacturers have had hurdles in getting robotics in. And I think what we're seeing with the evolution of STEM education, um, plug and play devices, portable robotics, cobots, those kind of things is the availability and the wider and broader uh, adoption of robotics across a number of smaller manufacturers. So I think now is the one of the times you can get someone fresh out of college with eight years of programming experience uh, on robots with the ability to come fresh out of college, program those robots, they can go to these smaller manufacturers, bring the robots in that have plug and play devices on them and be doing that programming and set up a lot themselves. So as that evolves, I think the system integrators need to evolve as well. And they'll continue to bring value with understanding the manufacturing process, um, understanding these new technologies, and then understanding how robots, these traditional arms get kind of accessorized with advanced perception systems of vision and how they can learn their environments and pick those locations or advancements in ease of programming for the cobots or portability of that capital so that the cobots or different robots can be moved to location of use and you can use that capital 
take it from one place in the facility on one application one day and then move it later that day, reprogram it because it's that easy and to redeploy it in another location of the factory. So I think that commodity takes place if you picture it as traditional robotics, but there's a lot of advancements in robotics that are, are exciting and continue to add value to that commodity item. Well, it almost reminds me of any kind of new shiny piece of technology or, or really, you know, um, any physical thing that um, anybody can all of a sudden buy. Well, just because you own it and try to, you know, put it to use, you know, doesn't mean that you're going to be getting the most of it um, or that you understand all of the applications that, um, you know, can, can help you see a true ROI on it. So, um, you know, the, the deep expertise in robotics is probably you know, more important than ever. Um, if you really want to be able to differentiate yourself, right? Yeah. And I, I think a good model too, is like, you look at Tesla, right. With, with the automobile, how long has the automobile been around and what kind of advancements had it seen? But now you take this compilation of different sensors, advanced software, and you start building the machine learning AI into those systems. And it allows what used to just be an automobile to now drive itself. Um, and just a big leap in that technology that I think caught a number of the large automotive suppliers off, off guard with how well it did. Um, and I'm curious with the robotics industry, if you'll see something similar, right? Someone gets into the actuator, they take software and these perceptive devices cameras, et cetera, LIDARs, tie them into robotics. And all of a sudden you see um, a leap in robotics um, with maybe a Boston biped, Boston Dynamics biped robot being the manufacturing robot of the future, um, potentially. But uh, there's there's an exciting time in robotics as, as all these things come together, right? The processing power is now there to do that. So it's fun to see. It's fun to be a part of. And uh, it's always interesting to talk about. Absolutely. Well, Ryan, you mentioned to me that um, upper management in manufacturing organizations have a tendency to assume that they need robots and they get excited by the shiny object and they jump straight to a tactical solution. And then meanwhile, in the background, you've got their production teams kind of reeling, just trying to get the job done. So I was wondering if you could talk about you know, how a organization, how an organization should evaluate when and where a robot actually makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I, Joe, I get this question a lot and I've got a, I've went to a lot of manufacturers that are in this position, right? They're trying to understand my manufacturing system is not working like I'd like it to. I know there's concerns with it. Executive team or board members are saying we need to automate. Automation is a solution and Automation is often paired with robotics, which is quite often the right answer, um, but not always the right answer. So it's going into those companies, understanding what the goals of the executive team are, along with what are the goals of the, of the plant managers and the manufacturing team. And how do we align those? How do we bring those into a point to build a bridge between those two groups and solve both goals? Um, understanding when to use a robot or when to use a different type of actuator, we'll call it, um, really comes down to the application, the return on investment, uh, the maintenance teams at the manufacturing facility. So is it a highly capable maintenance team that's done robotics in their past? We'll, we'll play in heavily to um, if you want to use robotics or is the executive team looking for putting those type of players on their team as well? To, to handle that kind of system. Uh, I think with some of the advancements in robotics we were just talking about, that level of capability can be a, a little bit different and more accessible. Um, so robots are becoming more the norm in manufacturing, but sometimes it's just a hard tool, pneumatic actuator that's needed with a simple system and, and no robotics. So it's really assessing what are you manufacturing? How are you making it? and what is the best tool in the toolbox to, to facilitate those goals? I do want to touch on one other thing here too, because 
often you'll see executive teams looking for robotics and it may not just be to solve a manufacturing problem. And I think there's concerns with kind of what the labor force is looking for, right? How do I, how do I draw in new employees, new talent, uh, and how to make the job desirable? So what I've seen over the past is the, a lot of the baby boomers are moving out of manufacturing and, and been okay with that job. A lot of the next generations were told, hey, manufacturing, my baby's not going to go to manufacturing. My baby's going to go to college and do something different. Manufacturing jobs do not have that allure for certain generations. But if it's a robotics job, it does have more allure. So how do I bring that allure into my company? One of the ways that you can do that as an executive team is to play to that desire for people to learn advanced technologies. And that can be by putting automation in place and saying, we're, we're a highly automated factory. We're investing in the future of automation. Um, we're hiring people that want to work with robots. We're hiring people that want to work with advanced technology. So it really is a, it can sometimes be a hiring advantage to put automation in place that is the newer shiny object, right? Because that's what people are paying attention to. And that's okay in their mind to, to have a job that's doing that. But if it was just standing on a stamping line, running a press, press break, that's not, that's not exciting or it's not uh, maybe perceived as the manufacturing job of choice. So, Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I, it's amazing. I feel like every other conversation I have on this podcast, this idea comes up of, you know, the, the labor shortage and, and the, the widening, um, you know, skills gap for machine operators and, um, and robotics and automation, I think to the general public have this perception sometimes of, oh, we're taking your jobs, you know, the robots are taking our jobs. Right. And I think the, the reality that, um, you know, I, I seem to be hearing from a lot of people like you who are in the heart of this world of automation and robotics is that no, we, we, you know, we can't find the labor and, and people don't want to do those jobs. And so the robots are, are helping fill that gap and you still need human beings to operate the robots and who understand, you know, robotics and have the skill sets and are trained in it. So it's an opportunity, not um, a threat, I think, more than anything. Would you agree? I would, I would totally agree. Um, one of the things I get to do in this, this job is, uh, that I'm grateful for is talk with different industry experts on a pretty regular basis. And, uh, I love what, uh, Eric Nieves at plus one, he says their, their tagline on the, on one of the walls there is, uh, robots work, people rule. And since I've seen that, that stuck with me a little bit is that people are the ones that make the systems work, make them run effectively. And, and I like to see robotics as a, as an amplifier, right? It amplifies the ability of the people on the team to produce more, to produce better, and also amplifies their ability to learn and educate and become uh, more technically savvy in those roles. So I, I really think it's, it's that more than the latter. That's a really good perspective. And Joe, you brought up the labor shortage thing. Um, is it, you said you, you hear it on every podcast, but, um, I feel like I hear it every day with different customers. It's a, it's a pretty regular occurrence across each industry that I talk with. It could be food. It could be e-com. It could be, um, uh, egg. It could be automotive. It, it really doesn't matter right now who we talk with. It could be appliances. Every customer that I've been talking with and in contact with seems to be struggling with that this year. And in the midst of a pandemic, you can, you can understand why people would be sometimes scared to come to work. And there's, there's probably a number of different factors that play into that, that have been challenging for uh, manufacturers. Yeah. I'm hearing the same thing all the time. So it's, it's a, it's a real problem for sure. Yeah. Well, it's a good lead in. I was going to sort of dive in into this, question um in this conversation you know this idea of even how the pandemic over the last year I mean, you and i are recording this on march 11th of 21 it was almost exactly a year ago to the day when yeah, you know, we, we yeah. sent our employees home with their monitors and and said hey you know 
we'll work from home for a few weeks until this thing passes. Right. And here we are a year later, but um, I, I'm kind of curious, you know, one year into this pandemic and with a labor shortage and issues on that front that were already, um, you know, uh, well in the works, what kind of vulnerability are you seeing manufacturers facing right now um, as a result of hiring challenges, people not showing up to work, you know, the impact of COVID on these companies and what can manufacturers do to mitigate um, that vulnerability as, as much as possible? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's real. It's definitely a real thing for a lot of customers and it's a challenge. Um, uh, there's, there's times where they're just down for a shift. There's not enough people to run the equipment or run the machines. Um, and then the hard part is that they, they still have customers and consumers that want to buy their products. They still have demand to fill. So the demand is still there, which is great, right? You want that. Mm -hmm. That's good to have, but the supply is, can be lagging because, uh, plant shut down or machines are stopped um, that are, are dependent upon uh, people coming to work, which is important, right? We want people at work um, able to help do that. And I think one of the ways that that will be mitigated, and I think some of the vulnerabilities that they're seeing is, man, my customers asking me for my product and I cannot get it to them. And that's not a good spot to be in. Um, for a couple of reasons, right? The consumers want it, you can't provide it. And then there's other, there's other penalties and incentives that come with some of the other manufacturers do. So some people get penalized when they're not shipping enough products. So there's financial ramifications there as well. And, and what I've seen from a request standpoint is that people are trying to understand how to automate areas of the equipment that they traditionally hadn't. Um, so, they have hard automation or they have a system that you can load the load the parts into and the machine will produce the, the part, uh, but there's no one there to load it anymore. So now the question becomes, how do we give robots the right eyes and the right hands to be able to load the components into the machine? And often that was a, a challenging off automation task because, and that's why it was left to the operator because it took that dexterity and took that perception. So some of those challenges, you'll see advancements in bin, bin picking coming along and different vision systems um, that allow you to detect or see those things. Different grippers coming along um, through on robot, through soft robotics, through Festo. There's all kinds of different robotic hands that are coming out to try and mimic the dexterity of, of people. So that's, that's one area where we do see uh, people seeking ways to still be producing and remove some of that vulnerability of labor shortages and the labor when it comes in will be aiding those automation systems but the the ingress and egress of the dunnage and the parts coming into the systems and going out of the systems that were typically front end and back end of automation are now kind of expanding out right can we automate those other edges that hadn't traditionally been done or were more complex to to do and this machine makes this part for one shift and I've got another one over here that makes it for another shift. So is there a way for me to move my capital equipment from loading this piece of equipment over here for one shift and then I, I need to shuttle it across the plant for the next shift to produce the, the lower volume system over here. So how does that robot gripper and manipulator adapt to those different applications? And then how do I program it quickly, which is where you know, earlier we were talking a little bit about the cobots and the um, plug and play efforts taking place. So. Well, let's let's go there then, because I, I think this is really interesting. Um, and and I know that cobots are something that that you talk about and deal with quite a bit. You know, as as the needs for automation become um, it, or sort of expand and become more advanced and find their way into places where they didn't traditionally. I guess used to be where, uh, like what role do you see cobots playing now? Um, how's that changing? How can they aid with some of the challenges that we've been talking about in this conversation? Yeah. And, and we talk about cobots as a new and upcoming thing, but uh, like, like the traditional robots, cobots have been around for 15 years. It's kind of crazy to think about. They've been along, been around that long, but uh, 
definitely a lot of advancements in cobots and what they can do. I think some of the differentiators between industrial robot and the cobot is, like we said, the industrials, high volume, high speed, high accuracy, where you see the cobot come in is a little bit lower speed, a higher mix, maybe portable, um, working alongside operators. So less safety, less, less hurdles to integration, I would say. So simpler to deploy. Um, and, and one of the barriers on cobots that we've seen in the past was just kind of the limited speed capabilities, uh, running at a safe range, understanding the safety of the end of arm tool. Uh, the last thing that anyone wants to have happen is someone gets injured uh, during their job. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to make sure that that's safe going through a risk assessment. But uh, one of the things that we see there is the advancements in cobots are coming along to where they can run at a higher speed and still maintain a safety. So that was a that was a trade-off often where people want to produce very quickly and make the parts as fast as they can. Probably not going to be a cobot because I have to go fast. Cobot needs to move slow, so if it hits anyone, it doesn't injure them. But the the sensors and the force feedback and that has been improving, so that those robots can react quicker and still remain safe around operators. So one is the FANUC CRX. We've got a couple of those here at Mission um, that that are able to go back and forth between a full speed, almost industrial robot to the collaborative space, which really gives you a lot of flexibility as a manufacturer to be able to be running at a higher speed. And then as a person approaches the cell, you can slow down to a collaborative speed and make it a safe system. So. I think that's where we'll see cobots moving into and allowing to help in that edge space of loading a machine. Maybe they don't want all the guarding around it because they need an operator to be delivering totes and bins and parts to the to the cobot and positioning the cobot in the right places, and then also coming in and and retraining the cobot to the next application. So that, that's where I see cobots really coming ahead. You see there being sort of a knowledge gap here from, um, you know, manufacturing organizations who are, are using robots or should be in terms of, you know, how the cobot is evolving. Um, cause it's interesting. I, I think I, I've been in a number of manufacturing facilities. I've seen these FANUC arms moving, you know, like crazy, uh, yeah. speeds and, and you can understand why a, a human being can't be near that thing. And so, um, you know, my perception has always been, um, you know, there's limited, capabilities for a cobot for the safety reasons you you describe but with the you know improvement in sensors and the the versatility of a, of, of a robot being able to go back and forth between working independently at a high speed versus an extra human being at a slow speed i'm just kind of curious do you do you think that there's a, a knowledge gap out there do people realize what's even possible right now yeah i think there was um early adopters of cobots mm -hmm. which will probably take a long time to come back to some of them right just because of some of those constraints and the capabilities of the early ones but uh, i don't know that they've explored it either so education out to the those groups is important and, and kind of talking through those advancements but i think people are understanding and starting to see that more mm -hmm. um, with the cobots um i'm actually a uh, celebrating my son's birthday this weekend and uh one of our one of our partners or good friend uh, at midwest automation supplies let me borrow his techman cobot so i'm going to bring it to my son's birthday party and surprise him with a with a cobot at the birthday party around kids right it's got some on robot grippers on it that are made to be safe around people so yeah it's one of those things where i'm comfortable i'm going to have it around around some kids and moving around slowly and it's it's safe so um, but there are different ways to do that. And definitely if you're in a factory and you see the big yellow arms moving around very quickly, don't go in there. You can't go in there. That's why the fence is there. But uh, some of the sensor technology and area scanners and other items that you can pair with a cobot can give you that higher speed and then also um, toggle it into a safe mode when there's people nearby. So that's, that's one of the big advancements too, is just being able to tie a couple of technologies together to make it safe and understand that it's safe. But a cobot with a steak knife, it's never gonna be safe. So <laughs> it's always gotta go through a risk assessment and proper safety assessment just to make sure that um, everybody's safe, right? 
Yeah, for sure. Well, I think that's a testament to, you know, the, the potential of, of a cobot when you can bring it to your kid's birthday party, which by the way, you're probably gonna be the coolest dad in, in the school. I think, you know, a little bit more interesting than when I had chuckles, the clown at my you know, <laughs> seventh birthday or whatever. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, well, Ryan, um, is there anything we did not touch on that you'd like to, um, you'd like to talk to our audience about before we put a wrap on this one? Joe, I don't think I had too much more. I just, uh, enjoyed talking with you and talking about the different robots and technologies coming up. And I think for the audience, everybody appreciate you listening. I'm grateful for the opportunity. And I think you'll probably have robots in your future in the next five to 10 years if there's not one in your house already sweeping your floor. So that's awesome. Um, well, great conversation, Ryan. Can you tell our audience how they can get in touch with you personally, as well as where they can learn more about mission design and automation? Sure, Joe. You can find me on LinkedIn. That's usually where I hang out um, for my platform under Ryan Lillibridge. And then uh, for mission design and automation, our URL is missiondesignauto.com. Uh, so you can find our website there and then also on LinkedIn and Facebook and YouTube. And then I uh, started hanging out in the clubhouse a little bit more, but uh, so new, I don't remember what my, my name is yet it's there. So, yeah, yeah. I've seen you, seen you pop into some of the, uh, the shows we've been playing with on, or the conversations we've been playing with on, on clubhouse. We, we just started manufacturing growth club for anybody listening who is, um, you know, dabbling in in clubhouse and if you have no idea what clubhouse is feel free to to email me and i'll i'll show you what's going on and hopefully get you an invite but it's it's really interesting so um we're by the time this episode is, is live and people are listening to this we'll have this one will have passed but we're going to be doing a, a conversation pretty soon with um a few guys from factory fix and um one other who sort of specializes in this idea of the you know how do we combat the labor shortage so i think it's really relevant to the conversation we had here hopefully we can pull you in on that one next next monday ryan but yeah that'd be great um, cool uh, okay. Well, awesome. So yeah, check out what Mission Design and Automation is doing. Find Ryan Lillibridge on LinkedIn. And, and Ryan, this was a great conversation. Thanks for sharing your expertise. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Grateful for the opportunity. Awesome. As for the rest of you, I hope to catch you on the next episode of the Manufacturing Executive. 